the time where I entered the hangar, I witnessed uh, recovered alien spacecraft that uh, the Department of Naval Intelligence in the United States was back engineering. He was a U.S. Federal Marshal, and he was sent into the area to pick up a man, a fugitive. Uh, when he got to the gate it, at Groom Lake, uh, he, they, 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 they led him on to make the arrest, but they required an escort with him. And then first they searched him, and then they, they assigned an escort, and, and when they prepared to leave, the escort handed him a, a black bag. He says, put it in your belt here, because if, when they, if a siren sounds, we pull the bag over our head and lay down on the ground face down and wait till there's an all clear. He says there are, are, are things here that are, are very secret and, and they can't be seen. So the man says, well, what happens if somebody looks up? If, if you don't stay down there, they said they're shot on the spot and ask questions afterwards. I have uh, <clears throat> had the opportunity over the years to interview, again, people who have worked at the test site at Groom Lake. Uh, one gentleman spent 12 of his 30 years in black programs at Groom Lake. When I asked him, I said, uh, first of all, I said, uh, do you believe in UFOs? And he looked at me with a straight face in one on one. He said, absolutely, positively, they do exist. I said, can you expand upon that? And he said, no, I can't. About a year later, we were talking about, again, activities at Groom Lake. And I asked him, I said, you know, can, can, can you really let me tell me what's happening out there? And he said, well, there's a lot of things that are going on there that I won't be able to tell you until, until the year 2025. But we have things in the Nevada desert that would make George Lucas envious. We are here at one of the most mysterious places on Earth. Behind these mountains begins the Black World, the super-secret U.S. Navy and Air Force test site known as Area 51. Rumors say that right here the test flights with craft from another world recovered by the military take place. In this film, we investigate these rumors and were, at the end, able to observe one of those mysterious UFOs by ourselves right here near the black mailbox at the desert road to Groom Lake. Nevada test site. The area comprises about 10,000 square miles. Uh, it's bordered on the south by uh, Mercury and on the um, west side by Highway uh, 95 and up here on the uh, northwest by Tonopah and across the top to Crystal Springs and down here to Las Vegas. This area right here is the uh, Department of Energy uh, Nuclear Underground Testing Area with all their areas labeled there. Uh, this is called the uh, Yucca Strip. Uh, up here is the Tonopah Test Range where the F-117 used to fly out of and now there's other secret programs going on up there. This uh, area all across the north here is used for the red flag exercises which is the Air Force equivalent to the Navy's Top Gun exercises. They come out of Nellis Air Force Base here and fly this whole area. Right dead center of the test site is what is known as Area 51, uh, also known as Watertown, also known as the Ranch. Uh, at the very center is Groom Lake. It's about 10 miles on each side, and this is where uh, most of the secret activity goes on. Just 10 miles south of the Groom Lakes complex is an even more secret area. This is where the uh, saucers, the disks, are flown, an area called S-4. There's nine hangars inside the mountain, and the disks are flown up the Emigrant Valley, uh, up in this area. They're flown like that. And this is where they can be seen from this road 
mailbox road, which is right here. It's about uh, 14 miles uh, from there to where you see the discs. Up in this area up here is the Tonopah Test Range, and one of the workers up there at this lake right here one day saw a big door open on the, in the dry bed of the lake and a disc come out of there. Area 51 was uh, basically a, a, a Navy training base until 1955 when, uh, in conjunction with uh, the CIA, Lockheed made a secret test base out of it. Uh, and the reason was to test the U-2. Uh, in 1959, 60, and 61, they also tested the SR-71 out of there, and it became a, a perfect uh, area in which to test secret equipment and secret airplanes. So it was because it was so remote, it was bounded on all sides by mountains, and uh, it was essentially a million miles from nowhere. The security that it provided was just exactly what they needed. Um, in the after 1960, uh, it became a uh, area to test not only planes. Uh, but equipment, uh, uh, machinery, all kinds of secret things that they had. Uh, in 1972, uh, there is, according to my research, a complete blackout of detailed information, records, what have you, for a period of 18 months. Nobody knows what happens between the summer of 82 and uh, I think it was January, uh, no, summer of the 72, in January of uh, 74. There's absolutely no records. They talk to security guards. They don't know what happened there. I don't know what happened there. Uh, I don't really have any uh, suspicions because um, the Flying Saucer program uh, began, Project Red Light began, it's my information, in earnest at Groom Lake in 1960. Uh, they did attempt to fly uh, one or two of the craft. There was a major accident and the testing operations shut down for a number of years. Uh, the testing operations began in earnest again, I believe in 1980, 81, 82, around that area. And the reason I say that is because the security increased drastically uh, during that period. And uh, I believe that uh, just south of Groom Lake, which uh, is in the northeast corner of, uh, of the Nevada test site, uh, is a place called Papoose Lake. It's a dry lake. Uh, there's a secret area there called S4, and I believe that that's where they test the saucers out of. Uh, my sources uh, are varied, uh, but the primary source being Bob Lazar, who worked on uh, one of the nine saucers that were stored there. Colonel Stevens, um, you investigated rumors about the top secret flying saucer investigation project in Area 51. Yes, the rumors became a little more real to me in about 1978 when I discovered my first participant in the changeover of that base to a very special facility where they took up the runway and laid in underground facilities and special laboratories and then relayed it and recon reconstructed the base to make it look just like it did before. The material that is now stored at Area 51, uh, I believe, came from the Roswell, Roswell crash in 1947, a crash at Aztec, New Mexico in 1948, and another crash down along the Mexican border in about 1949 or 50. Uh, the residue was first taken to Los Alamos and to uh, other areas in New Mexico under the control of the Atomic Energy Commission, also super, super secret facilities. They were smaller, and I believe that the real facility was constructed at Area 51 when they modified, when they changed over Groom Field to, uh, it was, it was a field on a dry lake bed, when they changed it over to become a special research facility. And I believe they transported the material that had been collected and held elsewhere to Area 51 about that time, at least much of it, for the research projects. Now that, that uh, changeover came and it began in about 1948, 47 or 48, probably early 48, when they modified the field, changed over the building and the facilities and put in a habitat where they could control an atmosphere for extraterrestrial guests is my supposition now. 
and they also put in laboratories for research. And it's been expanded, been worked, and expanded almost since that time. You got confirmation from the military, didn't you? Yes, uh, one in particular comes to mind. Now, he's not in the military, but he ran uh, several large military research programs here in Nevada. Uh, very top-level programs, uh, the highest classification. This is a person of, from a very prominent Nevada family, uh, well-known. It's provable where he worked and the kinds of things that he did. He, he also confirms that the, the alien technology has been in Nevada since the early 1950s that it was, uh, it was even here before the base at Groom Lake was built, uh, that one of the reasons that the Groom facility was built is in order to test this alien technology. He told me that there was a live alien in custody for a number of years, uh, that they had uh, difficulty communicating with the alien at first, but eventually developed some sort of a communication uh, abilities. He, uh, he is reluctant to talk. He's worried about what will happen to his family, but he has agreed to give me a videotape deposition that would be released only after his death. And I think when that comes out, it will not only confirm what Bob Lazar had to say, but shed a great deal of light on what our military, what our government has known about the alien presence for the past 45 years, including Roswell. Las Vegas, Nevada, city of gambling, city of the thousand lights. And, what only if you know, gate to a world full of military secrets. Here we started our investigation into the mysteries of the black world. Because behind the mountains, north to the glitter town, begins the Nevada test site. Nearly a state by its own. Surrounded by borders safer than any other border on earth since the Iron Curtain came down. Nuclear weapons are tested here. The stealth fighter was hidden here. And much more exotic planes are flown today. Our quest brought us to John Lear, one of the most successful and experienced pilots in the United States. The son of the legendary airplane designer, William P. Lear, has flown in over 16,000 hours, more than 160 different types of aircraft in over 50 different countries, holds 17 world speed records, and is the only pilot ever to hold every airman certificate issued by the Federal Aviation Administration. Since the Vietnam War, he has flown missions worldwide for the CIA and other government agencies, as well as many different experimental planes for the Navy and Air Force. Other insiders have told Lear about the secret UFO test flights in Area 51. But in 1988, these rumors became reality for him after he met a young nuclear physicist, Robert Lazar. In the summer of 1988, um, I was having this house appraised. And the appraiser brought along, who was very, the appraiser was interested in UFOs, and he brought along uh, a friend of his uh, who was a scientist, former scientist at Los Alamos. Um, the appraiser, being interested in UFOs, wanted the opinion of this scientist on UFOs. And at that time, I was doing a lot of lecturing. There was a lot of um, uh, publicity about me and UFOs in the summer of 88. Uh, so I met this gentleman. Uh, Bob Lazar, uh, and he didn't believe it at all. He told me that he worked at Los Alamos on SDI. He worked. Uh, he had a Q clearance. Uh, he had uh, a number of other compartmentalized clearances. He he uh, he knew a lot of secret things. He said that if there had been something like this, some cover up, that he would have known about it. So over the next uh, three or four months, uh, we got to know Bob very well. He got to know us, and we passed him various information, uh, which he checked out with the people that he knew that still worked at Los Alamos, specifically uh, people who had access to the classified library. Uh, I told him that Project Grudge, which the Air Force told us, uh, told the public was canceled in 1949, was still active. He was able to determine through his friends uh, who had access to the classified library at Los Alamos that it was still going on. Uh, there was another thing that uh, 
uh, I had mentioned that the one of the aliens that uh, we had captured were kept at a secret place called a YY-2 facility. Uh, he, in fact, found out that there was a classified mail stop at Los Alamos called YY-2. Now, that doesn't mean it would, they kept aliens there, but it, it showed that I knew secret things that were going on. There was enough evidence there that, that he thought, well, maybe there is something to this, and he wanted to find out. So having uh, the specialized, uh, uh, highly uh, educated uh, person that he was, he held two degrees, uh, master's degrees from MIT, and also knowing Dr. Teller, who was the father of the H-bomb, he was able to send his resume to Dr. Teller, who then called him and uh, uh, asked him where he wanted to work. Dr. P Teller proposed two places, either EG&G &G in Las Vegas or Lawrence Livermore Laboratories in California. Bob said, I want to work at Area 51. Uh, he didn't tell Dr. Teller the reason, but he wanted to get as close as he could to where we thought the saucer testing was going on. Well, during the next uh, six weeks after that, uh, he was contacted by EG&G. &G. Uh, he was given three security interviews uh, and three interviews on his uh, basic knowledge. Uh, they were so impressed that, uh, that apparently uh, they went ahead and hired him. The first thing that I knew is on December 6, 1988, Bob came up here as he usually did in the evening. I was sitting here writing checks and he sat right in that seat and I said, what's going on, Bob? And he said, I saw a disc today. And I said, I was so startled, I thought I didn't hear him right. I said, what? And he said, I saw a disc today. And I said, theirs or ours? And he said, theirs. And I said, you went to the test site? He said, yeah, I just got back. This is the first time I went up there. I said, oh, my God. I said, well, what are you doing here? I said, don't jeopardize your security clearance. Work up there for a while and find out what's going on. He said, he said no. He said, you've taken so much flack over this thing people not believing you, I'm going to tell you exactly what I saw. And for the next three hours and 47 minutes, he proceeded to tell me exactly what he saw on his first trip up to S4 at the Nevada test site. And basically it was that, yes, we had nine extraterrestrial vehicles. He told me a little bit about the power plants. He told me that he'd been briefed on the aliens that flew them. He told me that he'd, he'd been briefed on a number of other secret things. Um, he told me that uh, we, in fact, did have a secret base on the moon. He told me that we, in fact, did uh, have a secret base on Mars. Uh, a number of things, some of which were so unbelievable. It was, it, had I not known Bob uh, to be truthful, I would have been very suspect. But uh, I had known him for this period of time, and I had no reason to, to believe that uh, he would tell me anything other but the truth. Well, I had met Ed Teller at Los Alamos one day. Uh, we had a brief meeting and a, and a talk. Uh, I had shortly thereafter moved to Las Vegas and basically left the scientific community to do other work. Uh, Some time later I decided to re-enter and send applications out to several other national labs and also one to Ed Teller and he uh, gave me a call and he said uh, he might have something that I'd be interested in and suggested uh, that I go for an interview. Uh, shortly thereafter, someone from EG&G &G called and told me to come down for an interview there. Uh, they made it very clear that EG&G &G had nothing to do with it. They were just using the building as a place to do the interview. After a short time, they said I was basically overqualified for the position, but they may have something else in the future. And I don't remember how much time lapsed after that but uh, shortly thereafter, they asked me to come down for another interview, and uh, they said this was involving, uh, I don't remember their exact wording, but they led me to believe it was uh, a field propulsion system, and of course I thought it was something that, in secret, that we were working on. Uh, later, only did I find out that it was uh, you know, a back engineering program dealing with alien craft. I flew out of Las Vegas McCarran Airport and I flew to Groom Lake in a 737 aircraft. We land at Groom Lake and there's a bus there that drives about 15 miles south approximately. I'm, I'm really not sure exactly how far. 
uh, down to a smaller dry lake bed known as Papoose Lake. And right up against the side of the mountain is the uh, S4 installation. And what happened to you first when you entered it? How uh, did they receive you? Uh, it was very military-like. It was uh, certainly not a scientific atmosphere. Uh, very high security. Everywhere you, you walked, you had to have an escort, an armed escort, even, even into the bathroom. Uh, all doors lock and open with your, uh, with your badge. And uh, it was a very oppressive atmosphere. Um, how many times uh, did you spend on this atmosphere before you saw the craft for the first time? Uh, I believe I was only there two or three days, probably two days before I saw the craft. Mm -hmm. Time, how they are stored, what your impression was, and, and your feelings when you saw it. Well, my feelings, it was very... Uh, uh, I should step back a minute and say that when I first saw the craft the first time, it was walking into the hangar and uh, my impression was, well, this explains all the UFO sightings. This is just a secret military aircraft we're working on, and that's the end of that. It was actually the second time when I saw the craft, when I got to enter it and look over it, and I finally realized what was going on, that this is an alien craft. And, of course, this was after I read the briefings, and uh, that was a totally different feeling. That was not a feeling of excitement. It was a, almost a, a, an ominous feeling that uh, a feeling as if you shouldn't even be there. It's very difficult to describe. How did it look like? It looked like, uh, if anyone's familiar with uh, Billy Myers uh, sightings, very astonishingly similar to that, uh, that craft. It was uh, a very sleek, thin-looking uh, flying saucer-shaped craft. Uh, kind of hard to describe without drawing it, but uh, kind of a, a typical flying saucer shape. Did you um, see just one type or different types? There were nine total. Uh, I only got to essentially work, back engineer, or analyze one of the craft but there was a separate hangar for each of the crafts, and uh, each one was essentially different uh, in its visual appearance. Did anybody tell you where the um, U.S. Navy intelligence got the craft from? No. No, not at all. That's, uh, you know, a lot of people have speculated about it, that they were either shot down or they crashed, uh, but uh, the craft seemed undamaged, so I doubt either of those would be correct. Can you describe the inside of an alien craft? It's very plain. It's all one solid color, uh, a, a grayish pewter color, the same color as the outside of the craft. Yeah, there are no sharp corners anywhere. Every device in the craft, the seat, uh, the amplifier housings, everything has a rounded corner on it, almost as if it was all fashioned out of wax and then slightly melted so everything curved, even where the ceiling meets the floor on the end. Everything has a, a curve to it. Um, very, very plain, very wide open, uh, very impractical use of space. And there are three levels. The lower level um, houses the amplifiers themselves that swing, the three of them. The center level is where you enter the craft, where the seats and the amplifiers are, and the uh, top level is a small area, and I did not have access to that, so I don't know what's up there. Do you think they're alien craft or U.S. constructed? Uh, absolutely alien craft. There's no question about it. Why? Well, first of all, the scope of the project was to back engineer it. If they were United States craft, we wouldn't be going backward trying to find out how they were built if we had built them. Uh, second of all, the size of uh, the equipment inside, the size of the seats, the uh, materials that were in use, completely alien to us, pardon the pun, and, uh, you know, the fuel, element 115, essentially non-existent, uh, all these factors together, uh, and, of course, the briefing information stating that they were alien craft. Um, could anybody tell you how the propulsion functioned? Well, that was part of my job, was to back engineer that and uh, find out exactly how that operated. And they had made some progress, but uh, 
I really don't know how long the craft was was there being analyzed. Uh, if it was one year or ten years before I got there, but it seems like uh, only a modest amount of progress had been made. The propulsion system is really an amazing setup. Uh, there's two parts, there's gravity amplifiers uh, and the reactor that provides the power. The reactor itself is a, a total annihilation reactor uh, fueled by antimatter. Total annihilation is essentially the most efficient uh, nuclear reaction that takes place of the three, fission, fusion, and uh, annihilation. It uses a super heavy element, element 115, uh, as it would appear on the periodic chart. None has yet been synthesized on Earth. Um, it's my opinion that this occurs naturally in, in certain star systems. This element is bombarded in a, an extremely small accelerator. Uh, the element under bombardment uh, undergoes spontaneous fission and produces uh, antimatter particles. These are interacted with a gaseous matter target and by means of a 100 percent efficient uh, thermoelectric device is converted uh, into electricity. Now a hundred percent efficient uh, any electric device is essentially impossible. Uh, you know, the first law of thermodynamics says that's basically impossible. There has to be waste heat and things of that sort, but there's none detected in, in this system. It's uh, another amazing form of technology. Uh, this uh, tremendous amount of power the system generates uh, operates the amplifiers and also as a byproduct of the 115 undergoing uh, uh, this bombardment, it produces a uh, very interesting phenomena, a gravity A wave as it's known to be called. Uh, this gravity A wave is, uh, it travels in um, almost the same way microwaves travel. Uh, this is essentially applied to the gravity amplifiers and by means of the electric current also provided by the reactor it's amplified and focused uh, the amplified signal is shift, shifted slightly out of phase and, and by virtue of that they can repel or attract uh, a gravitational body. The craft can take off on one gravity amplifier. There are three in this particular craft. Uh, when it's using just one amplifier, essentially push, pushing away from the Earth, it's known as Omicron configuration. For space travel, the craft will rotate up on its side face the three gravity amplifiers at the target, they'll focus down on a single point uh, some tremendous distance away and the amplifier and uh, the associated uh, and the reactor, the associated reactor will be run up to full power and uh, they essentially pull the fabric of space, distort space and time toward the craft so they can traverse a tremendous amount of distance in, in virtually no time at all. They're not traveling in a linear fashion, they're essentially bending space and s space, the fabric of space essentially, and gravity and time are all interlaced. Uh, when you start distorting gravity, you distort time and space along with it. And these, are, these aren't theories. We've known these for a while. We just have no way of controlling them, but apparently the civilization has found out how. Um, did you manage, uh, did you people manage to fly one? They've done several test flights in it, now. not out of the atmosphere. Uh, these are short controlled low altitude flights. Uh, essentially they have a prized position here so they're not going to risk taking this to a point uh, where they could potentially lose it as uh, you know at the gravitational pull of the earth or going too high. But uh, I witnessed several tests um, outside the compound and uh, also one you know probably about a hundred feet away from the craft. How did the craft behave in the flight? Very, very quietly. It, it lifted off and it made a slight hissing sound, uh, a slight uh, blue glow from the bottom, probably due to the uh, extreme voltage that's present on the craft. Um, after a short time, that, that disappeared as it uh, rose and uh, just gently glided and later sat down. It uh, was very uneventful, but uh, almost totally silent.
Um, can you please describe the briefing documents and the information contained in it? Uh, it was, there were an extensive amount, 120 some odd uh, briefing documents, all of them very short. And uh, essentially what they were doing was just giving me an overview of the other aspects of the research being done on the craft and the bulk of the information, all the technical information was specifically dealing with the power and propulsion system, which is what I was supposed to be working on. But there were documents uh, uh, basically stating that uh, these were aliens that possessed the craft. There were some autopsy reports that uh, no, not very in-depth. They had no reason to give me in-depth reports on that, but uh, they did have pictures and, uh, uh, well, two pictures, actually, of the alien carcass with the chest cut open and a single organ removed, and the organ itself was uh, sectioned. Uh, it seemed to, from my non-medical viewpoint, uh, it seemed that this one organ performed uh, many functions instead of one. Um, there were documents on uh, metallurgical work being done on the craft and uh, really every aspect uh, that separate groups were working on. And I'm sure they got a briefing on what my group was working on, a very abbreviated one, as uh, I did on theirs. And this will say where the aliens come from. Yeah, it did mention the Zeta Reticuli system and uh, how that information was extracted from the craft. I don't know, maybe there were star charts or something along those lines. Did they contain any information about the um, history of mankind, the alien involvement in the history of mankind? Not, not really. Not, nothing that said, well, this is the way things were. Uh, there, there, there was mention of... Um, um, alien intervention uh, in in the past, I mean, it, it, extremely long ago, uh, something along the lines of uh, I, millions of years ago. Uh, from the information that, that I looked at, it, it seemed that, uh, and there again, these are briefing documents, so I can't, I, I can't myself ascertain whether or not these are true. I can only assume it because the briefing documents I read that pertain to the propulsion system were true because I, I dealt with that. But uh, they did make reference to uh, uh, contact with the Earth over 10,000 years ago, uh, also with uh, uh, genetic alterations that ended in uh, uh, a simian being and uh, all kinds of uh, claims. Did you ever meet um, an alien or some alien body? Other than in pictures, no. I've uh, mentioned several times that I had walked through an area and looked in a small window and saw something small there, but I don't, I, I really can't say that was an alien body. A lot of people jump on that and say, yeah, you must have seen an alien, but uh, there's just as much chance that they were trying to figure out the size difference and how the, the seats fit a body and, you know, they had made up a small mannequin or something. I didn't see anything moving around alive. So uh, I, I always say, no, I, I have never seen a living alien. What do you think you were chosen for the job? That's very difficult to say. I, I, really, I really don't know. I'm certainly not the most qualified as far as physics goes. Uh, so I really don't know. I've, I approach things at a very different viewpoint. Uh, they might have been frustrated after a long time of walking down the same path and not getting anywhere, and they wanted someone essentially to come out of left field and approach it from a different angle with a different viewpoint and uh, I'm kind of known for that. Why did you went public with the information? When? Why? Why? Uh, that's again a, a complex question. It's not just one reason. There's several uh, stemming from from many things. Harassment, uh, to protect myself, the fact that this information being contained is, is also unfair, but there are many, many reasons. After you went public, did they try to silence you in any way? Oh, in every way. <laughs> yes, I was uh, uh, shot at while getting on the freeway here in Las Vegas. Uh, friends were harassed and taken out of work that, that knew me. Uh, uh, many things happened.
Well, he was, uh, he was upset about the security at, at the base. It was an, an oppressive place to work. He was upset that they didn't have better scientists and a more open kind of research that would allow them to finally get to the bottom of how this alien technology worked. He thought that that information should be shared with the entire world in order to benefit the entire world. At the same time, he was going through some personal crises uh, that, uh, that, may, that led to him sharing some of this information with some people that he knew. Once he got caught, he was worried about his safety. Uh, they put guns to his head. Uh, they told him he was in a heck of a lot of trouble. And I think the reason he was willing to talk to me, at least what he told me in the beginning was, he was trying to save his, his hide. He figured by going public that they wouldn't dare do something to him. Uh, it seems to me that, that for several months there, after he was talking to me, there were serious attempts to intimidate him, to keep him quiet, uh, but he had the courage to pursue it. And I think he made the right decision because I'm not sure that he would be alive today if he had not spoken to the television camera. Michael, I was in Las Vegas television for 10 years. I worked stories about uh, political corruption, organized crime, illegal drugs. I've never done a story anything like this. Uh, when I first met Bob Lazar, I was only tangentially interested in the UFO material. I had done some talk shows about it. I knew the public was interested in it, but I didn't know if I was going to be able to do the story about Area 51. Uh, stories about Area 51 and possible alien technology there had been floating around for as long as I had lived in Las Vegas, but there had never been any thorough investigation, primarily because no one who had inside knowledge of the program had ever been willing to talk about it publicly uh, until Bob Lazar. Uh, when I met Bob, uh, I, I, I had a meeting with him and my news director. We, uh, we asked him a lot of questions. We asked him the basics of his story. It obviously is a fantastic story, but we decided to go forward with it because Bob himself seemed so credible. It, it became very difficult very soon, however, because uh, trying to verify Bob's background proved extremely difficult. It is still uh, proving extremely difficult. For example, we quickly found out that the schools that he said he went to had no records that he was ever there. Uh, his former employers, where he said he worked, had no records that he'd ever been there. In particular, Los Alamos National Lab was the linchpin of, of his credibility. We thought if we could prove that he worked at Los Alamos, as he said, it must have meant that he went to school somewhere because they don't just hire people off the street. And if he worked at Los Alamos National Lab on classified material, it made sense that he could have been hired to work at other classified programs, such as S4, Papoose Lake. Uh, however, the people at Los Alamos Lab said they had no records that he'd ever been there. They stalled on our requests for information. Um, they, uh, they wouldn't return phone calls. They wouldn't answer letters. It was as if they didn't want us to have the answers. Well, eventually, we came up with a lot of indications that Bob did work there. We found, for example, the, the newspaper from Los Alamos that lists him as being a physicist from the lab. We found the, the lab laboratory telephone book that lists him as being an employee at the lab. We have talked to other people at the lab who worked with him, who tell us that Bob did work on classified projects, that he was a, a physicist, that he was there. Just this week, almost four years, after we first started making our inquiries at Los Alamos, we finally got someone from the lab to say, yes, Bob Lazar was here. Yes, he worked at the Mason facility. Yes, that facility did some classified work. It's taken a long time, but now we know that Bob was there. We know he had a security clearance, uh, but we still know that there are a lot of the records that we're searching have not been produced for us. We don't know why. What convinced you most that Bob Lazar told you the truth? Well, I, I'm not 100% sure about everything that he says, because as journalists, we have to be somewhat skeptical. Uh, but a couple of things stand out in my mind. Number one is that Bob has always told the same story. The story that he told me on the first day that I met him about his experiences at S4 is the same story he tells today. And most importantly, when Bob got into some legal trouble, which in, in the eyes of many people, means that he's completely discredited. When he got into his legal trouble, he told the court system the exact same thing. Now, the, the, the courts, the interesting thing is, they're trying to verify his background, uh, the probation department, and they said, we can't verify his background, therefore he should go to prison. 
Well, my response to it is, welcome to the club. You can't get any information on his background. Bob was facing up to 60 years in prison if he did not tell the truth about his background. And the story that he told to the court is the same story that he told to me on the first day and the same story that he's telling today. After you interviewed Lazar on TV, did you come in contact with other witnesses from Area 51? Several witnesses, uh, more than a dozen now in, in total, have come forward with bits and pieces of information that confirm at least parts of what Bob said. No one has come forward with the kind of broad knowledge that he claimed, uh, but what I have learned from these other people uh, tends to confirm that what Bob is saying is true. The problem is that none of them have been willing to talk publicly. They will give me bits and pieces of information privately, uh, but uh, I'm restricted from using their names. And there's some very good reasons for that. There's been an obvious attempt to intimidate the, these witnesses into keeping their mouths shut. But three examples come to mind. One is a, uh, a former electrical engineer who worked in the television business, who moved uh, from Las Vegas and whom I worked with, moved to another city. He had told me by phone that he had seen a disc under a tarp in a building at Groom Lake. Well, I, I tried to arrange to do an interview, long distance interview, um, with, with a camera crew in the city where he lives. He agreed to do it as long as I blacked out his face. He comes out the morning after he makes the agreement to, uh, to give me this interview. There's a car sitting in front of his, his house, two men in suits speaking into a radio. He's not giving it much of a thought, but they followed him to work. When he gets out of work, they followed him home. No interview, he was scared. There's a woman who works in the court system here in Las Vegas in a very responsible position who formerly worked for a major defense contractor here in Nevada. She had sat in on meetings where she said the discussion between her employer and military officials was about wreckage from Roswell, which had been taken to Area 51, alien wreckage. She had agreed to give me this information in a private meeting that we were going to have but the day that the meeting was supposed to happen, she didn't show up. And I found out later she'd been visited by her former employers, and they had told her she's still under oath, she could be prosecuted. But what's more, uh, her employers hinted that harm could come to this woman or her family if she talked to me. They said, we know you do a lot of traveling. We'd hate for accidents to happen to you or your family. So she will still not talk to me now three years later. Uh, there was a third example, this man who performed the tax returns of persons who worked at Area 51. He had called me up on the phone at the, at the TV station and told me he would meet and give me this information. Uh, the next day, he's visited by two men who say that they're from the Secret Service and they wanted to ask him about his tax returns, uh, but he said that it was his definite impression they didn't care about his tax returns, they just wanted him to shut up and not talk about Area 51. Uh, so there are a lot of people like that uh, who have information, who could confirm Bob Lazar's story if they had the courage to come forward. I can't really blame them for not coming forward because uh, uh, our government or elements of our government or representatives of our government seem to use intimidation and fear tactics to keep these people quiet. The only evidence that we got is uh, we were able uh, to steal or otherwise obtain a piece of the fuel that powers uh, the saucers. Um, it was element 115, uh, it's a stable element, and we did several experiments uh, with this. We also videotaped these experiments. Uh, the experiment was to prove the high gravitational attraction, the, the heaviness of the element, and other things. Um, we proved it to ourselves. Unfortunately, whoever is in charge of the cover-up stole it back. The other thing was that uh, on, May, on March uh, 21st, 1989, he asked me if I wanted to view one of the test flights. This was on a Tuesday, and I said, well, sure, but how are we going to see one? And he said, uh, there's going to be a test flight tomorrow night uh, just at sunset, and uh, I know a place where we can sneak in, still be on public land, and watch it. And I said, great. So uh, I said, why at sunset? And he said, well, statistically, uh, up in that area, there's the least traffic ar around then. So I drove with Bob and uh, the real estate appraiser, Gene Huff, and myself, and we drove up there, got there just a little bit before, before sunset. I took my Celestron telescope, we took a video camera, uh, got out of the uh, car, and within maybe 10 or 15 minutes, this disc comes up from behind the mountains and starts doing all these fantastic maneuvers. 
uh, it was a light, a very bright light, and you couldn't see the disk form. But I had my Celestron scope with me, which is uh, eight inches, extremely powerful. And after a few minutes, I was able to get it right in the the uh, finder of the Celestron telescope, and I saw for myself it was a disk. There was no question in my mind, and I just watched it go down behind the mountains. We had heard about this location, and actually the ultimate the information ultimately had come from John Lear. We found out. We heard about the 29 and a half mile marker, the famous mailbox area. So we went up there. Our first trip was the first Saturday in January of 1990. And we arrived there about 10.30 at night. And while we didn't see anything on that trip, it was a Saturday night, we found out that the active nights are Monday through Friday, and the weekends are usually shut down. But what we did find out, there were several other vehicles up there, three motor homes and a couple of passenger cars. And talking with those people, we found out that they, having had gone out there on numerous other occasions, had seen plenty. So we were determined that, and we had understood from the beginning, that this was going to be something where on one night you would see nothing, and on the next night all hell might break loose. So we were prepared for the long haul. We were going to continue going out there until we should eventually see something. So <clears throat> then upon returning back home, I discovered that I could tune in the Billy Goodman happening out of Las Vegas in Santa Monica. I could receive it. So I started listening and almost the first night <clears throat> Bob Lazar was being interviewed by Billy Goodman. And I in listened intensely. And I discovered from Lazar's interview that the best nights to go out there are Wednesday nights. That they pull out most of the stops on Wednesday nights. Now the reason for that was explained that when they were preparing this facility and the operation, they did a study on Highway 375, the public highway through the action zone, Tickaboo Valley. And they determined from their study that there was the least traffic on Wednesday nights on Highway 375. So that's why Wednesday nights were chosen <clears throat> for most of the action. Although we, on, in having made numerous other trips, determined that almost any weeknight is effective, Monday through Friday. But Wednesdays always seems to be the most prolific, probably for that reason. <clears throat> but then, of course, we wondered that since we were going out there on a Wednesday night, maybe that would perturb the formula, and then, of course, it would shift to some other weeknight. Who knows? So, but still, nevertheless, it seems that Wednesday nights still continue to dominate the, with the greatest amount of activity out there. So our next trip was Wednesday, February 28th. Now, on our first trip, I had gathered together about seven or eight friends, and we caravanned out there and saw nothing, of course. Then I started organizing the same group of friends to make this second trip, but this time it was in the middle of the week. And lo and behold, when it came close to the time to depart, we found out that none of our friends could make it. Work weeknight. So, Pearl says, Boy, I don't think I want to go out there all alone. I said, oh, don't be ridiculous, dear. I said, we obtained this information off radio, KVEG, clear in Santa Monica, being broadcast from Las Vegas. I said, there are people all over the western states that are hearing this. We have a tangential interest in UFOs at this point. Think of the people that have a voracious interest in the subject. You're going to have people going out there from all over, and I'm sure the word is spreading to other countries of the world, You'll probably have people out there from Australia and Europe and all over the map to say nothing of the people from Las Vegas close by. I said, there could be scores, even hundreds of people out there. Don't be ridiculous. So we went out there. We were all alone. I was actually outraged. Well, anyway, we got out there, and I believe we arrived around 3.30 at the mailbox, and we decided to go to the Little Alien for dinner. And we came back and got to the mailbox by about 5.30. It was, beginning, it was dusk and beginning to get dark, <clears throat> Wednesday, February 28, 1990. And <clears throat> I got out my lawn chair, and suddenly at 7.30, the first craft came up. And I was astounded. I leaped out of my lawn chair, had a camera around my neck, my 35-millimeter point-and-shoot camera, Nikon Action Touch, and I took a couple of shots, and then 
we actually about every 45 minutes a craft would come up one at a time. We had we saw six craft that night, each one in succession, and it was craft number about two or three that was was the most dramatic. That is, it was the one that came the closest, and I took a photograph of it. What we actually saw, Michael, was a craft that was ellipsoidal in shape. It was pulsating brightly, and while we couldn't see the outline of the craft, the strict outline, we saw this very brightly pulsating ellipsoid. And when I snapped some shots, apparently the camera, with its low-end optics, that is, we didn't have a huge magnifying lens, so it didn't bring the craft in so close that it would have appeared as a giant blur of light. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> plus, it must have caught the craft in a trough of its pulse because the photograph captured the craft beautifully. That is the outline of it. So it was just a, a fluke of being at the right place at the right time and <laughs> having the right optical setup. Going to Bloom Lake, Area 51, what happened to you on this night? Well, on that night, February the 21st, 1990, I took, uh, accompanied a crew from Nippon Television Network uh, to witness the a test flight of an object over Groom Lake, which is known as Area 51. We arrived at the site around just after sundown because according to the information given to us on that same day when we visited Mr. Lazar, at his residence, he said that if you go there after sundown and stand near the mailbox area of Highway 375, looking south towards Groom Mountains and also to the Jumble Hills, you will see test flight of these objects. And lo and behold, when we arrived at the scene, exactly around 6.45 or so, we started seeing and uh, we suddenly started seeing an orangish, yellowish uh, light uh, suddenly appear on top of jumbled hills, making a motion to the right for about uh, 15 seconds or so. Next, exactly at 8.15 p.m., we had another sighting of an, the same object that suddenly appeared on top of jumbled hills came up above the hills and uh, uh, made its appearance, went slightly to the right side, and at that juncture in time, it made a sudden descension and a back turn, which I estimated to be uh, possibly about 5,000 feet sudden descension, a back turn descension. And I had never seen anything like that in my life ever. And it is definitely a test flight of highly unusual uh, object, a demonstration of technology, a propulsion system so exotic right now. That we don't know what it was, but it was being tested at that very night. Well, I've become probably the expert on Area 51 in the United States since uh, February 26th of 1991, which was my first trip out to Area 51. On that trip, I got as close as I have ever gotten to a flying saucer. It was the first time I'd ever seen a UFO, actually. I was traveling in a car with, with my friend down the road, and a very large object flashed over the car and then began to float probably about a mile away from us in the open desert. We got out of the car ran towards the object and got within a few hundred yards of a large disc-shaped object about uh, 40 feet in diameter that looked like a, uh, a saucer with a teacup on the top of it. It glowed a brilliant reddish-orange color and then glowed a real bright yellow color. Uh, on one occasion we thought that the object was actually going to explode because it glowed so brilliantly it would shoot up to about 200 feet in the air, make a falling leaf motion back and forth and then go back down onto the ground. Um, this object was uh, was amazing. I was so excited because I'd never seen anything before like this ever in my life. 
We got our faces burned. We had a mild case of radiation poisoning after that. Uh, we had fevers for three or four days of about 102, 103 degrees, which we felt was radiation poisoning. And since then, I've been out to the Area 51 area uh, probably some 40, 50 times or so, and have take, taken quite literally hundreds of people out there. We had gone to a place called Rachel, where there was supposed to have been this gathering of people, uh, one of which I had heard on the radio in Los Angeles, and that's what seems so intriguing. We passed this large group of people in the middle of nowhere out in the desert. There was a tour bus and probably 24 cars or so it, just in the middle of nowhere, total darkness. We went on by them and went into Rachel. We, we stayed there for about 45 minutes just listening to the conversation going on and decided that the place to be was probably the group of people that, that we had passed about 15 miles back. We went there and sat and began watching like it seemed everyone else was doing and then we had the first actual sighting. I, would, I looked up in the sky and I thought there was a really bright star up there and I said John is that star kind of moving and right about the same time I saw that and he goes yeah I think it is and right about that time it just like like a falling star dropped out of the sky and and, and just came straight down to the right above the a mountain range that was about five miles away from us and and just stopped there and hovered and then, and, and then moved around the mountains a little bit, making various maneuvers that no aircraft could possibly make. And uh, then it just, it didn't just stop and then it, and then it lowered itself down below the mountains out of view. And that was the, the, the first of uh, many weird things we saw that night. And uh, the, the people on the bus were there at that time. They, they got all applauded like, oh, there was a sighting. And, uh, and it was getting late, it was about one, well, it was not even quite midnight then. And they, uh, so they all kind of applauded and said, well, that's there. And they all got in the bus and left. Did you recognize any details? Not at that time. Not at that time. It, that that uh, particular sighting was completely on the other side of this large valley that was at least uh, 15, 20 miles across uh, at the, the point at where, where we saw it come down and float across the valley. Yeah. The most dramatic thing that happened that evening was uh, after every, a large number of the people had, had left, including the tour bus, it was down to three cars, and we were sitting in the middle of these three cars and had been watching a light maneuvering uh, kind of wildly out on the other side of the valley and were just intrigued as it came straight toward us as if it was singling out uh, Jeff and I in particular yeah. from from this lo lo immense distance away in a straight line and there was a car on the other side uh, uh, on our right side that had the dome light on and they were making sandwiches they didn't see this happen yeah, there was a car was totally <laughs> on the left side was going on they didn't see it happen they had the seats down and I think they were making out yeah and we were absolutely stunned uh, I, I felt absolutely awestruck as this light that we had been watching came well, straight, straight toward, toward us. us. In just an instant, it crossed that long valley, and and, and uh, right Jeff became us. actually frightened because it, <laughs> right we're, sitting it in, we're sitting in a pickup truck, and I'm looking right over, right up like this, and it stopped and hovered, practically right over us, and uh, and then it turned on a light from the from the uh, edge of the craft, and I mean, and when it came over us and stopped and hovered. The light seemed to be on the top of it, and it revealed like a silhouette of a disc. And you clearly say it was a, it was a disc-shaped craft, and it made no noise whatsoever, just hovering above us. You know, probably maybe what under 100 feet in you know in altitude above us. Yeah, yeah. And it stayed there and hovered for a few seconds more, and that's when I was starting to get worried. You know, that something else is going to happen now. Now that they checked this out, maybe they're going to land, or you know, I didn't know what was going to go on, so I got, I got pretty scared at that point. And right about the same time I got scared, uh, the thing just zoomed back over the mountains. And I mean, you're, you're talking about like, oh, what was it, 10, you know, five, five, eight, ten miles. And within a split second, it was over this mountain range and then, and then stopped and then just lowered itself on the other side of the range out of, out of sight.